Welcome back to Water Resources. Um, this week what we're going to cover are some of the basics of streams and stream processes. So we're going to start today with fluvial hydrology. Alright, so let's watch this short video first. I thought we'd start with it because this video shows a, a small stream here in Missouri that's just in a minor flood event. But see how dynamic it is, how much the gravel's moving around, bouncing, just how violent the flow can be, even at this small. Imagine what it would be like during a really big flood, or if you were a fish or macroinvertebrate living in this stream at this time. Now, before we go any further, let's review a little bit about the surface and subsurface hydrologic pathways that water can take to get to the stream itself. We've covered this in earlier lectures. I'm not going to uh, go into any depth on it here other than to mention these things and encourage you to go back, to go back and review those uh, lectures and um, reading assignments, the related re reading assignments. Um, obviously, through a watershed, there are lots of different pathways that water can take. Um, some water, some rain might fall directly on the stream. Others will fall across the hill slopes, become infiltration, move through the soil, um, eventually join a stream that way. Of course, groundwater is the source that recharges our base flow predominantly in our streams. Um, so the sources of surface runoff, once again, this is review, precipitation, um, storm events, snow melt, flows from groundwater and aquifers, interflow through the soil, subsurface drainage through the soil, um, and then uh, anthropogenic inputs would be return flows from water used in industry, agriculture, etc. Of course, in um, Module 2, we went over the watershed factors which affect runoff in great detail. As I mentioned then, this is a very important topic something we're going to keep coming back through the semester. So if you haven't already learned these, make sure you know these watershed factors. They're really important. And a lot of what we're going to talk about in this module and future modules are the way that these factors um, integrate with one another and sort of conspire together to influence the hydrology and geomorphology of our watersheds. We've also looked at this uh, hydrograph before. It's hypothetical hydrograph for a watershed. Um, so here, same watershed, same size, same amount of rainfall, same everything except looking at how the hydrograph would vary if the land uses were different. So the urban, the urban watershed is going to have a much flashier response, a steeper, um, quicker hydrograph response to a storm. Um, than say a forest or a prairie, which would be at the other end of the spectrum of a, a slow, gentle response to the same storm. All right, so now this is where we start the new stuff. Um, let's just talk for a second about the basic uh, channel parameters that we see in a stream. Um, first of all, we've got the wetted perimeter of the stream, kind of what it sounds like. Um, this is the where the water and the stream bed interface. So this wetted perimeter is right here on the stream channel. It's the bottom of the stream. Um, the channel bed slope would be the slope that the channel bed drops with elevation. So of course, water flows downhill, streams run downhill. Um, it may be, and often is, different than the water surface slope. So we can measure both of these slopes independently by surveying techniques to get a channel bed slope and a water surface slope. At base flow, these may be different. During floods, they come to approximate one another a little more closely. Um, we've got stage. Stage is the depth of the stream. Um, and then the width of the stream at the top of the, at the water surface is also shown here. Uh, mean depth, we could calculate the area, which would be the cross-sectional area of the channel, divided by the top width. And the hydraulic radius, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, is the area divided by the wetted perimeter. 
So first, we'll come back to some of those concepts, but the first one that I want to tackle is discharge. So discharge is the amount of flow in a stream. It's measured, um, it's measured based on the formula V times width times depth. V being velocity, W being width, D being depth. Of course, width times depth, if you think about the simplest um, channel shape, which would be a rectangle, width times depth would be the cross-sectional area of the channel. Um, so we can really simplify this equation to uh, Q, VA, Q being discharge, and V being velocity, A being area, so Q, V, A. Now let's think about those units. Um, velocity would be measured in a length per time. An example of that would be meters per second. Area would be length squared, so like meters squared, square meters. So meters per second times meters squared would be cubic meters per second. So our volume for our, our units for discharge are volume divided by time. And volume in its simplest form would be a cubic length, so a cubic foot, a cubic meter, those are volumes. So length cubed per unit time is the strict definition of the units for discharge. Usually that's expressed um, as cubic meters per second, liters per minute, gallons per hour, etc., or some combination of those, whatever is appropriate for the context you're working in. All right, now we can think about the relationship between these, um, these three variables, discharge, area, and velocity, using a highly technical apparatus carefully engineered to predict the interacting effects of discharge, area, and velocity upon one another. It's called a Viquist stick. It's something that uh, um, I've invented. And let's take a look at a Viquist stick. So let's look at our Viquist stick. If I can get that centered, maybe I'll back up a little bit here. Um, as I said, this is a highly technical, carefully engineered um, uh, device, an apparatus for doing science. And um, it's not just a ruler with three sticky notes on it, even though it looks like that. Um, but it shows the relationship. So here, I'm going to put my finger and hold velocity constant. If velocity is constant and I increase area, so if I make the cross-section of the area of the channel greater, discharge has to increase based on the mathematical relationship. Now, if I hold discharge constant, so if discharge does not change um, in the downstream, dire downstream direction, but area increases, the velocity, or oh, I, I increased velocity. I'm doing all this in a mirror, essentially. So velocity increases, discharge stays the same, area decreases, right? Kind of makes sense if you think through it. If we don't change the amount of water flowing, but we make it flow faster, it's going to require a smaller area to flow through. Now the same thing here, if we hold discharge constant, increase area, velocity has to decrease. And we can do this wherever you put your finger, that's what you're holding constant. You move another variable, we can move discharge down, hold velocity constant, and that means area has to decrease. So it works, just put your finger for whatever you wanna hold constant, move the other one up or down, and you see the relationship to the other two variables. So it's a really simple tool, but it's something that can help you get your head around this math, even if you're not a math whiz. Okay, so we mentioned hydraulic radius earlier. Um, let's come back to that for a second and explain what it is. First of all, we need to take the area of our channel, and in our diagram on the right here, our area is the red rectangle. So the area for this channel would be, uh, since it's rectangle, it's relatively easy to calculate the area. It would be two meters deep by five meters wide, which would be 10 square meters for our cross-sectional area. Um, our wetted perimeter, which is width plus two times depth, and let's just think about that for a second. We've got 
the in a rectangular channel, our simplest example here, we've got um, our width at perimeter would be two, the depth on the left, plus the width of the channel, which is five, two plus five is seven, and then the depth on the right, which is two more, so nine would be our our uh, width at perimeter, or width five plus two times depth, two times two is four, five plus four is nine. All right, so if we look at the math down here below channel B on the right, we see that our width at perimeter is nine. Um, hydraulic radius is equal to area divided by by width at perimeter, so 10 square meters divided by nine meters, which equals 1.11 meters is our hydraulic radius. Now, both of these channels have the same cross-sectional area. Um, channel A is 10 meters wide and one meter deep. Once again, 10 square meters. Um, channel B is 10 square meters, but it's twice as deep and half as wide. Um, and they have a different hydraulic radius. So hydraulic radius is really looking at um, how big a perimeter the area is distributed across. All right. So it's the same cross-sectional area, but it's distributed across a different perimeter. This has to do with something we call hydraulic efficiency. We are going to end part one of the fluvial hydrology lecture here. We will continue in part two, starting with a discussion of hydraulic efficiency.